I'm Ann Bartell, professor at Columbia Business School. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here to this very important conference. As Bruce indicated to you, it's very difficult to do research on this topic because it's very difficult to find adequate data uh, to test many of the hypotheses and the impacts of various programs. We've put together this morning a very talented panel of researchers who are going to speak to this question. Uh, let me just briefly introduce our four panelists this morning. Uh, first, uh, to my immediate left, Amy Dittmar, uh, who's a professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. Uh, then to her left, my colleague David Ross from Columbia Business School. Uh, continuing down the line, Mona Lena Kruk, a professor of political science at Washington University in St. Louis. And Susan Sturm, who is a professor here at Columbia Law School. The format for this session will be as follows. Each speaker will have 15 minutes to present. And then after all the speakers have uh, finished, we will open it up for Q&A. Uh, so we are going to start with Amy. I'm not used to I feel like I'm going to sing. Um, so, uh, so thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me. I think it's a pretty unique opportunity to bring people together from so many different academic um, as well as practitioner backgrounds. Um, it is unique in academia for that to happen. So I'm excited to be here. The paper I'm going to talk about or the topic I'm going to talk about comes from a paper that uh, was on the web page for the conference, so you may have seen it. It was previously entitled The Changing of the Boards. Um, it's now being suggested that it's going to be called The Impact of Firm Valuation on Mandated, mandated Firm Board Representation, and it's co-authored with a colleague of mine, Kenneth O'Hearn. So as Bruce mentioned, it's hard to do research in this area of um, the impact of women on something like boards because there aren't that many women as CEOs or on boards. And so what we have done, hmm, is there, okay, I can, oh, that's okay, I'll do it, it's fine, it's fine, go across it down. Okay, so what we have done is we've studied a very unique example of quotas that have been imposed in Norway. And I'm guessing in this crowd, you're probably somewhat possibly familiar with what has happened in Norway. But let me go a little bit through the timeline um, because it, it, I think both the timeline as well as what happened is important. In 2003, the end of 2003, Norway's parliament mandated that 40% of board of directors must be women. Right? Initially, they mandated that, but it was a voluntary compliance. I think the best way to think of that is they gave no threat of what would happen if you didn't comply. So within two years, you, they, there was not enough compliance that they felt that this was called a success. Only about 13% of the firms had complied. At that time, in early 2006, they changed the law um, to, in, to make it a mandatory compliance. And the stick, if you will, that they held behind that is that if you did not comply, your firm would be dissolved. <laughs> so it was a big stick. Um, <laughs> And so um, by 2008, not surprisingly, most firms had complied. 77 firms, 77 firms actually had not complied, and they were delivered delinquency notices, said that they had three months or they would be dissolved. Right? So um, I think that that's a, a unique experience for us to be able to, to study. And so what we're going to do in this study is we're going to examine um, the impact of this law change. Now, this is a very, it's not only a, a unique policy uh, change that has happened. As a researcher, it's a unique opportunity. Because for those of us that study boards of directors or changes in things of gender, things don't usually happen because someone makes you do it. It usually happens, for instance, with boards of directors, the changes typically come about, when would we see a 40% change in boards of directors? When a company is in trouble, when something has happened in a company. So this is a huge change for boards that occurs because of this exogenous um, influence. So from a research standpoint, that makes it a nice, clean study. 
We study two aspects. I'll focus on the second of that today, both the importance of this change and what we can learn from a governance perspective, and also the impact of this gender quota on the firm. And that's the part of it in my 15 minutes that I'll talk about today. So what do we actually do? What are we actually looking at? We have what I believe is a pretty comprehensive sample of the firms in Norway. Um, let me just briefly um, mention it, if for no other reason than it was painstaking to, to gather. Um, the, the data we have is for all the firms that are publicly um, public in Norway, which is what the law applied to, it didn't apply to private firms, that are listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange. And that's going to be important for data availability. We look at their um, data, their information, um, in particular their, their value, which I'll talk about in a moment, between 2001 and 2008. And we collect not only the financial data, which I'm a finance professor, so that was a bit of a focus, but we also gather individual data on each board member. So if you think about looking at an annual report and that bio they have on a CEO or a board member, anything you could pull out of that paragraph, we pulled out. So their age, clearly their gender, where they went to school, what degree they have, what their occupation is, what company they're with, insider, outsider, share ownership in the firm. It's a pretty comprehensive data set. And it's a pretty large data set when you think about how many actual individuals are in there. So what do we want to look at? What we're going to look at in this study, and I think it's important to think about specifically what we are asking, is what the impact on the firm is, right? And I'll, I'll give this caveat at the end as well. We are not talking about the social welfare implications or the societal changes because of this quota, which is a little different than Esther's study. We're going to be looking at the impact on the firm. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the change in the value of the firm. Now, why are we going to look at the value of the firm? Well, one reason we're going to look at the value of the firm is because maybe the short answer is companies care about the value of the firm quite a, quite a bit. And so that's going to be important for them. And if you think about it from a policy implication, understanding those implications are going to be important to the company. However, there's another reason to think about looking at the value of the firm. This law just changed. It's very hard to see long-run implications of this. But a stock price or a value of a firm is just that. It's an accumulation of everyone's expectations of the future of that firm. And unlike the, the study of Esther's where you are voting in the majority rules, it doesn't take the majority to determine a stock price. It just takes buys and sells and trades to move that stock price. So we can see what the expectations for the future cash flows and decision making will be by looking at the, at the change in value. We're going to look at two different measures of value. We're going to look at the change in the value of the firm the year they implemented the change. So the change could happen between 2003 and 2008. That's going to be important. There's kind of staggered compliance that we're going to be able to utilize in our study. Um, we're going to look at the change when that actually occurred. And to do that, we're going to essentially look at the market value of the company, so the, the stock price times the number of shares, or essentially the value of that firm divided by some base measure, the book value, more of an accounting measure that wouldn't necessarily change in order to get a picture, controlling for other things that might ch change inside the firm. We're also going to back up and look at when the law was first announced. And when I show you that data, um, I'll tell you a little bit of a story about the announcement itself, which is kind of um, interesting and, and fun, but also makes that announcement quite important. Okay, so that's, um, that's what we will do, and that's what I'll focus on today in my talk. So let me get to the, the results. So in the analysis of the Q, Q is going to be the value of the, of the firm in the year they implemented. What we're going to do is we're going to look at um, the, when the boards changed by 10% of women. So it's basically adding one woman, because they may not have added all the women at one time. So we look at both like when they first initially start adding women as well as when they actually reach the 40% hurdle. All right? And we look at what the change in the value of the firm is. All right. So, what we find, and we're going to compare that, the firms that changed, to the firms in Norway that were not changing in that year. And that's where I say we're utilizing that stand, staggered compliance. In some other studies that aren't, tests that aren't shown here, we're also going to be comparing that to other countries that didn't have this quota. But today I'll focus on, on the Norway effect. What we find is that the firm value drops by approximately 14% after controlling for other changes in the firm, such as accounting data. Right? And, it, and that, that, that change is 
related to the change in the board member. Now, I'm going to hold off on saying what about that board member, because even though we're talking about gender, at the end of the paper, we're going to try to understand why did that value change, because the value change itself is really only half the story. All right, the next thing we're going to look at is that was when the actual implementation of the quota occurred. Now we're going to back up and look at when it was first announced. So this is the first, the first time the country of Norway, or really anywhere in the world, anyone who trade those stock prices, would have had any idea that this was going to happen. Now typically when we talk about policy change, it's hard to look at announcements because they're discussed so much in the press. And so you have to think about, well, is that really the first time it was mentioned? Was that really a surprise? Um, in the case of Norway, it was. What happened in Norway was that there was one man that was on the parliament um, that was not in charge of the family ministry, so he was not the person implementing this change. He called a reporter and he said, I have an unprecedented announcement I want to talk to you about. No one, he had never mentioned anything about this before. He gave an interview and he said, we're going to do a 40% quota. If you asked him later why in the world he did this without talking to anyone else in the parliament, um, and why he, he suggested it in this way, he said, if I got it out there in the public space, I knew they couldn't vote it down. Whereas if it went through the, the more parliamentary trajectory, it might kind of end before the public ever heard it. So that's important for us because that means that there was a huge, and if you look at Norwegian newspapers, the day this happened, it was all over the place. It really was very big news and quite unprecedented. So here we're not going to be able to compare, before we were comparing firms when they complied to when they didn't comply, we need a comparison group. Um, and so we can't compare, everyone in Norway heard the news at the same time. So what are we going to look at? Well, you can think about some firms who are going to have more of a, um, we'll call it a constraint, in filling those board seats. They're going to have more women they were going to have to get onto the board, a bigger change. And others were not, because some firms already had women on the board. Approximately a half of the companies had about one woman on the board. So the average was about 10% of, of, the, of the board. It's pretty, pretty standard, but also pretty low. But that, the fact that some firms were already maybe a third of the way there allows us to look at some variation. So we're going to compare the stock price reaction of those companies that had at least one woman on the board to those that had no women on the board. All right? And what we see is that the difference between those two stock prices is negative. And what I mean by that is if you had no women on the board, then your stock price was going to drop by about 3.5% more than if you did. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean this was bad news for all companies, all right? And we're going to get to the, the evidence of, of why this uh, drop occurred. Because actually, I don't have a, the actual table here, but for the firms that already had someone on the board, the stock price reaction was positive. And so it might be that these, these firms already had um, networks and avenues that they were going to be able to fill those spaces um, with, 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 good, you know, with good candidates. And so for them, it was a positive. But, on, but if you compare the two groups, those that had the the bigger constraint had a, had a negative. All right. Yes, I see it. Thank you. So what we've shown so far is pretty daunting, um, especially maybe depending on, on your perspective on this question. But it does show that there's a decrease in value when the quotas in Norway were implemented. Now what we're going to ask is why. And here we're going to utilize that data that I talked about collecting from those bios. Right? We're going to look at, well, what is different about the women from the men? But maybe, I think, at least even more interestingly, the women from the women. Because some of these firms already had women on boards. And so we're going to compare the characteristics of those that were chosen for the boards post-quota to pre-quota, as well as to the, the, the men that were on the board. So basically, pre-quota pre and post-quota board members. What we find is that they are younger, they're less like, this, these aren't surpri this isn't surprising given the concerns we have about women rising up in the organization and what Bruce was saying. They're less likely to have CEO experience, of course, if only 2% of the CEOs are women, it's going to be hard to find women to be a board members with CEO experience. They were more likely not just not CEOs, but they were more likely non-executive managers. So they were less likely to be in that top five of the company, more middle managers. They were less likely to hold an MBA, but they were more likely to hold a higher education degree of some other type. So they were highly educated, so you can see why they would have chosen uh, the women for that reason. They also, as time went on, and this has gotten a lot of press, were on more boards because they were more in demand. All of a sudden, these companies had to fill up 40% of the spaces. 
So there's a large literature on busy boards and how that might be um, difficult to spend your time on each board if you are a busy board member. They were outsiders to the company. They were more likely um, not from the firm. Now, something to note on that I think that's important is that here in the United States, um, boards tend to be, at least historically, um, pulled from a lot of inside the company. And Sarbanes-Oxley, which changed our governance, said that we really should be pulling from more independent boards, more outsiders. So we tend to think outsiders are good. Norway is a little bit different than the United States. Most of their boards are actually already from the, from the outside. So, um, so they have fewer internal candidates. And, and the, and these, but these were, women were more likely than the men or the pre-women to be from outside. And lastly, not surprising, because there may have been cons some constraints in filling these positions, they pulled from a larger pool from different countries outside of Norway. All right, so if we look at these characteristics and we take this back to this drop in value that I've just documented and ask, why did the value drop? What we find, and this is, I think, a really an important part of the paper, and, and one I think that sometimes, at least in the popular press, has gotten missed a bit, so I want to hit it home pretty hard, it was not the gender that mattered. In fact, the gender effect goes totally away. It is not that the fact that the, the candidates were women made the value drop. What explains the drop in the value is that they had less experience, all right? Board members are... If they, if they have an importance, and our, and our paper certainly seems to suggest they do, they are meant to monitor and advise the company. And the candidates that were chosen, um, possibly because of the pool of what was available, are going to have less CEO experience. As I mentioned before, their occupation was less likely to be listed as a board member. So they were going to have less prior board experience, though they did have that. Um, they were going to get it quickly with those busy boards. They were younger and they were um, more likely an outsider. The positives here I have listed here, what it means is that the value of the firm is higher if you do have CEO experience, if you are an insider in Norway, if you are a board member, and if you are older. Those are positives about being, uh, that's, that's reflected as a positive on the value of the firm. And here we see with the with the women characteristics that it's not surprising that that's going to pull that down, and that's what explains. Right. So if I think about what, what all of this means and where it leaves us, right, um, I think that what this paper does is it really takes a first look at a first law. So the Norway law is really one of the, the first to impose this quota. It is not by means the last. There are several countries that have recently either imposed or are considering um, laws. Um, but with, a, with a similar kind of 40, maybe 50 percent. And so I think that it's important to understand the implications. What we do in this paper is we examine the effect on firm value. And so what we show is that there is, at least in the short term, a cost to the firm of imposing these quotas. And that cost is because in some senses, you can think about the motivation for the law to begin with is because women are not rising up in the company. And so if what you need by, from a board of director is advice and monitoring, you're going to need people with the experience that it's like you're in a vicious circle. The women actually don't have because they haven't gotten to that point yet. And so that's going to impose a cost for the companies. Um, because of that, that limited experience. And, and this is assuming that they ch it's, it's a limited experience because the pool of candidates doesn't have it. I, I'm assuming that the companies um, chose the best women out there. I, I'm, I'm staying away from the idea that they were kind of padding the board with women and that's why they don't have as much experience. I do know that they weren't padding it with their family members because we checked that. But it, it does seem that they um, were, were choosing what, because as I said, they have higher degrees. They do have management experience. It's just not upper management. It's just that they don't have as, as, as much of qualifications as the men on the boards or these kind of pre-quota women. Lastly, I want to leave you, actually, with two things, if I have time. First, I want to leave you with a caveat to this study, and I already mentioned one of them, and that is that it is important to note that I'm looking at firm value. And the reasons for changing the law in Norway was not to maximize firm value, all right? The reasons they chose to change the law in Norway was because they felt like they, for one, college is paid for extensively in Norway, and the, I've spoken with the family minister in Norway, and the motivation was they felt like they weren't getting much out of their investment. They were investing a lot in these women, 50% were in the colleges, but then they were hitting these glass ceilings, as, as well as the fairness to society reasons. So we are not looking at kind of those other social welfare. The other effect is that this law really is so recent. And so 
it, it makes sense that over time, if women were to gain experience, if we were to nurture women in a way to help them move up into the companies, this effect may go away. But at least in the short term, it seems to be there. If I have a moment, um, the one the other thing I will mention, just some other kind of casual evidence um, that kind of shows some of the impact um, besides the firm value, and this is in the paper, but I didn't have time here, and um, is that there were some other things going on in Norway that also seemed to indicate that um, firms were not happy with this law. And that is that you saw that the percentage of firms that were public versus private um, was decreasing. Now, I don't know for sure it was because of this quota. It was over the same time period that there was a trend toward going private. There was also a trend the the EU opened up that you could be incorporated in a country different than your origin. And you saw that the number and percentage of firms in, from Norway that listed in the UK compared to other countries was much higher. So there was some avoidance, possibly, of the, of the law as well. Because we're just looking at time trends, it's hard to say that's causal, but it's at least suggestive evidence. All right, thank you. Okay, well, thanks, folks. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers for giving me this chance to, uh, to speak to you today. So if the last paper was about, um, if the last paper was about boards, I'm going to talk to you today about executives, present you with a couple of papers, one about top management teams and another about um, CEOs themselves. So here is some data. This has already been alluded to. Um, but this is the S&P 1500, which is uh, supposed to represent a broad cross-section of corporate America. And this red line is the percentage of firms that have an, even a single woman on their top management team. No, 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 this is not the percentage of the top management team that is women. Okay, then it would be much lower. So if you think about the top five to eight executives who run a given company, even today, after lots of progress, fewer than a third of the companies have even a single woman, and it's flatlined in recent years. Kind of depressing. So, you know, is there a business case for it? We know what the moral case is. Is there a business case? Well, as, as Bruce alluded to earlier in his opening remarks, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward to argue that if you have a more meritocratic human resources process that helps women overcome the barriers to their own advancement, you should have a higher quality workforce and you should have a better performing firm. And indeed, researchers over the years have gone out and compared firms that have women near the top versus firms that do not. And lo and behold, firms with women in top management tend to outperform those who don't. But you know, here's the funny thing. If you go out and talk to a lot of senior executives about whether there are gender problems in their workforce, oh, no, 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 no. We have a perfectly meritocratic human resources process, so this just doesn't apply to us. We're already in the category of firms that do this well. So is there any argument you can make to that such, a comp touch such an executive and say, well, yeah, even if it would still be a good idea to make some room for women near the top? In other words, can you say that even your company would perform better? And that's what I'm going to try to talk to you about a little bit today. Now, in order to make that kind of argument, you really have to say that women are going to bring some kind of a different quality to how the company operates. And here's here are the arguments you tend to hear. One is that if you have a senior female executive, she acts as a role model for women in middle management. They work harder because they think that they can make it. Women are taking a larger and larger role in the purchasing decisions of families. It's no longer just the husband who decides what car to buy. So you need to have women who understand what female consumers want. And there's also this idea that women actually change the nature of the interaction when they're part of the group that makes decisions. So why would that be? Well, first of all, simply having someone from an out group, whatever that out group is, race, gender, nationality, tends to improve decision making in many circumstances. That person brings additional perspectives, changes the nature of the social dynamics, et cetera. More controversially, there are also, there's also some evidence from the lab and from anecdotal reports you hear from practitioners that there are, there are different tendencies in how men and women tend to manage. And in, in short, people say that women are more collaborative, that they're better mentors, they encourage more voice, it's a more democratic style of management. And here's a kind of a pithy quote from a male executive who essentially makes that statement in his own words. So with that as motivation, what we wanted to do is we wanted to sort of compare firms with themselves. Let's go back to that S&P 1500. A given company, over time, sometimes they have women, you know, at least one or two in the top management team, sometimes they do not. Do they tend to perform better or worse when there's some degree of female representation? And lo and behold, we find that they do. Now I have up here, I call it market to book. It's actually Tobin's Q. It's the exact same measure that Amy was talking about in her paper. You can use other measures. This is just a nice one to make a little chart. And you see that the exact same company tends to do better when they have at least one female executive on their top management team versus when they do not. 
Okay, great. So that's a nice sound bite you can use with a recalcitrant senior male executive who doesn't want to hear about the problems that are going on in his own firm. Great. Um, but we wanted to push this a step further and see if we could say anything, anything at all, about what the underlying mechanism might be. Well, it so happens that there's a large, large, large literature in management, many, many, many studies using many, many different kinds of methodologies, which basically says the following. If you want to get your employees to be creative, to generate innovative ideas, to come up with new ways of doing business, then you should manage in a collaborative, more mentoring, encouraging voice style. Which, remarkably, I mean, I didn't rig this, folks. It overlaps almost completely with the way some people, anyway, are claiming women tend to manage versus men. So if that's the case, when a given firm is, you know, so let's say, focusing more on innovation in what they do, and we're going to proxy for that using R&D spending, we should see a bigger pop in performance from female representation on those occasions. So we kind of went into this expecting to see that kind of positive influence. We weren't expecting this. Essentially, 100% of the increase in firm value and firm performance comes from this focus on innovation. If a firm is sort of just treading water and doing things the same old way, there's no harm, but there's no obvious benefit in the data that we're looking at from having female representation. But as you focus more and 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 more on innovation, spend more and more on R&D and things like that, the benefits that we see in the data basically go straight up. Now, does that prove, in quotes, prove, if I had two hands, I would prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt there really are these differences in the way men and men, women and men manage? No, of course it doesn't prove that. But when you add it to the lab studies and the reports you hear from practitioners and stuff, at least there's an indicative case that there might be something like a so-called feminine management style. But if that's the case, what do we do with that information? So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and then segue into the next study. Um, the first thing is, you know, I mean, what does that leave men, right? I mean, look, let's talk about what's going on in the schools. I mean, sure, some of y'all know, girls are crushing boys in the schools. All these you know, fancy schmancy, you know, magnet high schools, you all heard of them, Hunter, Stuyvesant, um, you know, Towns and Harris. If they didn't gender stratify, they'd be overwhelmingly female. So if women are better managers too, then in 50 years are we gonna have in the same conference, but everything's gonna be flipped around? I mean, it seems strange. It seems strange, but you wonder. The second thing is, you know, the senior executives in this study were, were quite old, and I, I'm a 40, so I'm going to say, you know, 40 is old. I, I teach people in their mid-20s and sometimes younger, and I can tell you something. They don't experience gender or race or sexual orientation the way you and I do. I know, I know, you're probably my age. Oh, come on, I'm a progressive, you know, I'm with it. No, no you're not. I mean, you think you are, but they really do see things very differently. And, you know, maybe, maybe they've already moved beyond this. I don't know. The other thing is, and this is the one that bothers me the most, is like, okay, let's go turn the clock back to 1970. And you're a woman. You're not a good manager. You know, go be a nurse or something if you want a job. Well, where are we now? Well, now we're saying you're a great manager in this very specific way. So that's a lot better. It's a better stereotype, but it's still a stereotype. Is that really where we really want to be as a society? Just some thoughts to think about. And finally, you know, what exactly determines the male attitudes that make female representation in senior management possible? And, you know, for me, that almost becomes a little bit of a personal thing. You know, I mean, Bruce might be laughing. He always asks me, you know, Dave, why are you doing this kind of research? I mean, you're not the person I would have thought of. Believe me, that's what everyone asks me, but it has a very simple answer. I'm a father of two girls. And, you know, it's not like I was against gender equality before, but now that I got two girls, I'm, you know, suddenly this issue is kind of salient, you know, and suddenly, you know, it's hitting me pretty close to home. And so, you know, I was talking with some colleagues a little while ago, and, we decided, you know, I can't be the only, you know, person who's become enlightened in some way because of parenthood. Maybe there are other people out there too. And so that leads me into the next thing I want to talk to you about. Now, you all have heard about the wage gap, right? You got a woman, you got a man. You got the same education, you got the same education. You got the same experience, you got the same experience. And yet the man's getting paid this much and the woman's getting paid that much. You see it all over the world. So what if, what if the gender of the child, what if, you know, is there something about what might influence the, you know, the attitudes of CEOs and such that might cause this gap to close? Well, we went to Denmark. And Denmark's a country where as soon as you emerge from the womb, they hand you a number. And with that number, they know where you go to school, who, you're, who you marry, you know, who your kids are. They even know the prescription medicines you take. And they store all that information in a central repository. Now, if you're Danish, if I were Danish, that might scare me. Okay? But as a researcher, it's great because I get to see everything. 
So what my co-authors and I did is we, we went and we took basically, basically a 15-year slice of Danish history, recent Danish history, and we looked at every single Danish person in every single Danish company. And we said, what happens to the wages of each individual employee when that CEO has a child? Well, when that CEO has a son, nothing much happens. But when that CEO has a daughter, the wages of women rise relative to those of men. And in fact, that keeps going for each additional daughter you have. So, <laughs> so you know, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, you, when you look at a result like that, you heard some of the things we heard from, um, from Esther Duflo earlier. It makes me wonder, you know, hey, if a guy like me is not beyond redemption, maybe we're actually closer to solving this problem than we dare even to hope. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much also for, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. I uh, got my PhD at Columbia, um, the building right next to us. That's really exciting to uh, be able to come back. Um, I, interestingly, this is the first time I've ever been in this building, so uh, that was also an exciting opportunity to see the inside after passing by for so many years. Um, so my, my presentation, I'm a political scientist, and um, it's going to pick up on some of the themes that Esther talked about. Um, earlier, um, and I'm going to talk about some findings from my own research, but also from um, kind of the broader literature on the use of quotas in politics, um, and how that can, um, I think some ideas that I would have for how we can inform the discussion on uh, women in corporate boards in, in particular. Okay, so just to say something a little, you know, a little bit about what corporate quotas are and, and how they compare to um, to political quotas. So um, the whole discussion about uh, quotas for women on corporate boards is a really, really new phenomenon. Um, Norway passed their corporate quota in 2003 uh, as the first country, um, and since then we've seen a number of countries um, propose it, um, pass it, or it's been passed in one house, uh, still um, pending uh, approval in another house of parliament. Um, also in uh, in Germany, you might know that the uh, Deutsche Telekom, one of the biggest companies in uh, in Germany, has also passed a, a corporate quota for um, all of its offices around the around the world. So, um, it's, but it's still relatively new and a very sort of limited number of, of cases. So it's about ten countries, depending on how you want to count that. Um, and that compares to um, political quotas in a pretty dramatic way. Um, so political quotas have been passed in more than 100 countries around the world. But interestingly, the vast majority of those policies have been passed since 1995. So it's also really new. Um, but I think there's an opportunity here to, to think about what's happened um, in politics and to, to think about the ways in which that could be extended to, um, to the business world. So just some of the, the things that are just basically different about um, these policies, the ways we could think there are some parallels. So the, the corporate quotas are um, either mandated by law or, in the case of Deutsche Telekom, by, by the firm itself. Most of the time, they apply um, not to all companies. Um, it, it just it varies. So most of the time, it has to it applies to state-owned companies. Um, in some cases, it also applies to public limited companies. Usually, only those with um, a certain number of employees. In some cases, there's also um, municipally owned companies, uh, pub, uh, and a few cases, uh, private limited companies as well. Um, only on, on management boards, um, the proportion is usually 40%, which I think is interesting. Uh, and I think it might have to do with a, a contagion effect from the Norwegian case, because that, that was a 40% policy. Um, in the Norwegian case, interestingly, I think it builds off the political quotas, because um, Norwegian political parties, uh, almost all of them, have a 40% quota for, for women as well. Um, but it's the reason for that 40% figure is interesting, because the way, they, um, the way that it's written in, in party statutes is that um, uh, there should be at least 40% at least um, of each sex uh, put forward as candidates. So it's actually for both men and for women uh, in a gender neutral way. And this 40% uh, 40, 40 requirement is really just as a way of kind of being a little bit flexible about the equal numbers. Say, you know, rough, roughly want 50%, but we're not going to be super strict, so there's, there's some flexibility built into that. But the goal is really gender balance here. Um, in terms of the policies that we've seen, um, it's hard to say, of course, what their effects have, have been because um, many of these are still in transition to being um, implemented. Um, but as, as Amy has pointed out, the Norwegian case has been a stunning success. Um, before the corporate quota, there were 6% women on management boards. Now it's 44%. Um, but that's because the, uh, the requirement is pretty strict, right? You, uh, you, your company is dissolved if, if, uh, if you don't comply. Um, in, in Spain, they have a similar 40% requirement, um, and it needs to be implemented by 2015. 
Um, but companies haven't moved on this at all. And there was an interview with, um, uh, with a high-level male leader of one of the companies and said, well, what are they going to do if we don't implement this? Kill us all? Um, and so there's really a sense that there weren't really going to move and there wasn't really a sense there would be a huge sanction. So just to give you a, a sense, of there's important variations across, across countries in terms of how these are designed. In terms of the, the political quotas, they are either inscribed by law, requiring all parties to have women um, as their candidates, um, and in many cases also um, by individual parties. So there's, a, I guess, some parallel there. But um, so different forms it can take. Um, the, 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 I guess, the target audience are political parties. Um, and they're focused on, usually, on the percentage of women on candidate lists. Um, and that's, that's, I think, also picks up um, on, on what Esther's talked about in terms of the case of France. So in France, they reformed the Constitution and changed the electoral law to require equal numbers of male and female candidates. The first election in which that uh, requirement was applied, women's representation went from 11% to 12%. Right? So virtually no change at all. Um, so you know, it, it, it has to do with the number of people that you, you, you um, nominate, but necessarily um, outcome oriented. There are, in other cases, though, um, the, the quotas are written. Uh, they actually require that seats are, uh, be reserved for women. So in those cases, like in India, 33% of the seats are reserved for women in local government. You will get at least 33% women elected. So there's, there's some differences there. Um, also see a, a contagion effect in terms of how, what these policies look like, um, but most of these tend to be a 30% policy. Um, and that, I think, also um, has this, this contagion effect, and, and that's because 30% has been identified by the United Nations as what they call a critical mass. Right? So you don't need to have equal numbers of women and men, but women have to be a large enough minority in order to be able to affect political outcomes. Um, some of my work that um, I've done otherwise has really tried to dispel the idea of a critical mass um, in terms of its automatic nature, but um, that's been really per persuasive in, in the political sphere in terms of um, really trying to promote women's representation. And I think 30% of politics has worked because it's not, it doesn't sound as scary as 50%. All right? So a couple of cases where 50% is, is, uh, is applied, but it's, uh, it's quite unusual. But, um, just like the corporate quotas we've seen, um, they've been really, had these really mixed effects. And this also has to do with the way the policies are designed, the context in which they are um, implemented. But political will has been probably the most important um, aspect of this. Even when a policy is not it designed in a very sort of flexible way, um, if there is a will to implement it, that becomes um, very important. And I'm just reminded of um, David's point about you know, it, it really matters who's at the top in making decisions um, in terms of um, whether or not these types of uh, outcomes can, can come about. So um, just to say something about quotas, the nature of, of quotas as a solution, right? It sounds like, uh, you know, an incredibly drastic way to, um, you know, to try to change outcomes. And um, so I think that um, it's important to really think about why people would be uh, applying a quota, right? So um, in political science, we talk, we try to use the economic metaphor to say, well, the low numbers of women elected to political office could be the result of a supply problem, right? So it could be that maybe not enough women are coming forward, right? So what we need to do is increase women's skills and resources. But the alternative is really the demand side solution, which is women are qualified, but um, they're being just actively discriminated against by people who are in a position to, um, to nominate them. So quotas in that uh, context are really a demand side solution, right? Um, and the argument that has been made in um, the political quota debates are that women actually are qualified, often extremely well qualified. And we, we know that um, from the data we know about you know, women um, going to university and um, higher levels of professional achievement. So the real argument is, is that you know, women are, are qualified, but they're discriminated against. So where we need to intervene in this process is um, at the level of elites. right? So that's what quotas do. They say that you really need to change the way that people who are, who are making these decisions um, really think about um, the, uh, the, the identities of people that they are nominating. Um, and so in these debates, what we see uh, really, really interesting parallels. Um, when parties adopt quotas, it's almost always because of an argument that it's going to help the party compete more effectively with other parties. That it's going to help, in particular, parties capture female voters. Um, whether or not women actually vote for those parties because they have more women um, is, is sort of another, another question, right? But the argument is that it's going to increase the performance of the party. 
Um, and we see that very similar argument made for, for firms, and that's also why Amy's work is really important for this. Um, but this is really the argument that, that's made. Um, and so that's really kind of the direct effect um, that parties are going to benefit from this. Um, and also, in a kind of a longer term effect, there's this idea it's going to bring about this broader change, right? It's going to create new role models for, um, for women in, in particular, but also going to kind of change how people think about women in leadership positions more broadly. The critiques of this, of course, just don't buy that, right? Those sets of arguments. The idea is that, you know, uh, if you have a quota, those are women who wouldn't make it there on their own, and so they're unqualified. Um, also arguments that it decreases the, the performance, right? Um, and that it really aren't able to, uh, to really have this role model effect because quotas are demeaning to women, right? So an argument is that, well, we really should just wait for society to sort of change and slowly, slowly evolve. Um, and of course, you know, these debates have been around for, for a really long time, but introducing quotas really heightens the attention to quota women, right? And what they're doing, these expectations that they should be changing politics or having these broader, um, broader effects. So in the, um, in the political sphere, there's been, um, I guess, a, a longer literature, right, on these questions, and I think we can think about the ways in which they would apply or, or not to, um, to the business realm. But some of the things that we learn from, from political quotas that become really important. So if we just start with the numbers, right, that seems to be like the most, you know, objective way of measuring um, the effects of, of quotas. And what we see in the political sphere is that there is an incredible amount of resistance to trying to to regender electoral politics. Um, and that's really, I think, tells us that quotas are not gonna bring about this automatic um, shift, right? Just in terms of being able to implement them and just to achieve that basic um, over, uh, outcome is, is very difficult. Um, and it's really interesting to me that if, if party elites paid enough attention to actually trying to find good women, I mean, they actually, like they spend this amazing amount of time trying to think about how to contravene the law. So in, um, in Bolivia, this actually uh, involved wide-scale electoral fraud. They put forward candidate lists that looked like they had 30% women, but they'd actually just changed the gender of the men. So if the man named Emilio, his name would be listed as Emilia. Um, and I just thought, they have these phantom candidates, and it, it was just shocking. I think, really, like, that took a lot of thought, you know, to think about how to contravene the law. And, I mean, all sorts of creative ways in Brazil of, like, reading, like, well, it says you have to reserve places for women, but that just means that, well, we still nominate all men, but we reserved a couple seats for women, but we, you know, we just won't fill them. So, like, there's just different ways of, like, reading the law. Um, and they're very qualified women out there, and um, what we see this is incredible resistance. And I think that we, we all just see this what will probably occur in um, the Spanish case in, in, in particular. And so that becomes really important, that um, the resistance to, to these changes are, are incredibly strong. Um, we also see this, at, I think, at the cultural level, too, because even though in Norway we have um, a lot more women elect, um, brought into the corporate boards, women are still a very, very small minority of the leaders of those boards, right? They're still like two or four percent, right? So it could be that you're bringing more women in, but they're not into those really, really high level um, positions. And that's another reason why the um, Indian legislation is so interesting, requiring women to, to also be in those top, top leadership positions. Um, in terms of qualifications, the, the research on politics is actually really interesting. Um, and I think it highlights some interesting dilemmas when we think about recruiting. And um, in particular, I'm thinking about the conflicting um, expectations and trends or um, metrics for evaluation, right? So in terms of finding, um, finding women, right? So on the one hand, you know, there is this evidence showing that, well, the women who come in through quotas in politics tend to be related to very powerful men. Right, so they're kind of reproducing the same the same elite, um, but there's actually some very very interesting data from a number of countries showing that the women who come in tend to be a lot um, relatively younger than the average uh, member of parliament. Um, ethnic minority women also are coming in um, through quotas, so it's really creating new opportunities for um, for different people to come in. But see, that raises questions about um, what to make of those differences, right? Um, because for some people, it's really important, at least in politics, for those women to, um, to have the same qualifications, right? To say that they're qualified, well, they want them to have the same educational level, same professional background, levels of political experience. But at the same time, there are others who say, well, we want women to be different from men, right? We want women to bring about political renewal, right? So if women are the same as men, for some people that would be good, for some people that's bad, right? If they're different, then that's good and that's bad. So it's kind of, you know, people actually having different expectations and any finding is going to be unhappy, you know, an unhappy one for, for somebody. Um, but one of the things that's really come out of the political data is that oh, pretty much invariably women tend to have less political experience than men. Um, 
But yeah, because women have been excluded from being able to accumulate that experience. Um, and so I think that that's, um, quotas are really interesting because they're helping it really sort of fast track um, certain women um, ahead of you know, having to wait for a very long time to work inside um, the political parties for a very long time. Um, and so it's actually a gendered reason for this, right? And I think people say that as an argument against quotas. Well, I think that's an argument for quotas. Um, and I think if we think about the sort of short-term versus long-term effects, over time I would imagine that the women probably come to experience, um, be much more like, uh, have a similar experience levels. Um, so data from Uganda is very interesting in this regard because they've had reserve seats since 1986. Turns out the women who get elected to the reserve seats have more political experience than women who get elected to the general seats, um, and more experience than the men. So I think over, over time that, be, that becomes important to, to, to talk about. Um, in terms of performance, okay, I, I think here we also need to think about the role of um, perspectives and outcomes, and I think maybe that's a nice way to think about David's results compared to, to, to Amy's. So um, in, in politics, when we talk about, um, okay, so one thing has to do with policy making approaches. So being elected through a quota because you're a woman, right, you could think, well, that that would give a woman a mandate, right, to say that it's really important to me. I was elected as a woman. I'm going to prioritize women's issues. I'm going to focus on um, promoting women's interest. But quotas can also have the opposite effect, which is a label effect, because there's a negative, you know, a stigma associated with being um, elected through a quota could actually lead women to deliberately not, um, to try to disavow the quota, to disavow women um, as a group. But this also emerges from dynamics of tokenism, right, which they're just not confronted by, um, by men, right? It's because of the conditions of, of women's um, inclusion. And so I think we have to be aware that there can be these, these opposing um, uh, possibilities. But as the indicators have changed too, it depends on, well, how are we going to measure this, right? So we could think um, in terms of, well, uh, quotas are going to change the perspectives that are articulated, right? Polit the change the nature of political debate. Um, or we could think that they can change outcomes, right? So say firm, firm valuations. So the research on, on uh, quotas in politics, there's a, a study of Argentina which found that the introduction of a quota led to a huge increase in the number of new bills proposed on women's issues, but led to almost no change in the number of bills passed on women's issues. Um, for the simple fact that women are still a minority of legislators, right? They're not in the, the powerful position, not the heads of committees. Um, and so it seemed to be that they're really changing, you know, Things are a lot less tangible, right? In terms of you know proposing, getting new ideas out there, changing policy styles, um, you know maybe having these more collaborative um, relationships, and so the question is what what's the most appropriate place to measure, right? Um, and I think that when we think about comparing the results of different studies, we want to think about whether or not we're talking about sort of the perspective aspect or the the outcome aspect. And just in terms of role models, just maybe to add what what, um, what David said, it's, it, there's not very much research on this yet. Um, but what is interesting that the research shows that in countries which have quotas, women tend to be more politically interested and engaged. Um, and that a lot more women think about running for office who would have never thought about running for office before. Um, and I would imagine that a corporate quota could have a similar outcome. And it's because, you know, there's a signal there, you know, when there's so... <laughs> the office is full of men, right? It makes it really difficult for women to think about, a young girl to think about um, aspiring to, to the, that type of position. Um, but of course, this is going to be mediated by um, the knowledge people actually have about, um, about the presence of, of the quota and whether or not that, um, that gets translated into outcomes. But I think that the, the small amount of evidence we have about that seems to say that there is an important role model effect, um, and which in the case of politics is, is really about promoting um, greater democracy um, and uh, citizen engagement and, and, and participation. Oh, and uh, I guess I don't really have time here, but I did want to say that um, in, in terms of, it's not really the focus, I think, of, of, of the work here, but there are also some really important non-quota strategies, and I, I just wanted to say that um, these also are some really, initiative, really interesting initiatives we see both in the U.S. and, and beyond to try to bring women in. Um, in the U.S., they've been really important because quotas are just not on the agenda in, in our country. Um, but what we see is actually these types of strategies work really well together, right? Um, Nordic countries, a number of these... Um, these strategies have been worked combined with, with a quota strategy. And I think that, that um, is, these are really kind of supply side strategies, right? So the supply and demand can, can work together in, in a really effective way. Um, but what I think we see from, from these different types of experiences is that those supply side strategies um, have much 
much, much more modest effects um, because they are long-term strategy. And um, you know, you could try to get more women to think about running, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll come forward. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to, to win. Um, but we do see that there has been an effect of those types of strategies. Um, demand side strategies are much more effective, um, but of course they themselves are also not, not a guarantee of, of, of outcomes. But I think together it shows that conscious strategies, I mean, it's not enough just to sit and wait for um, the world to change around us. It is these conscious strategies that become really, really important. In, in the US, the, the very small increases we've seen has been the result of a lot of these types of non-quota strategies to identify good women, to help them raise money, um, to publicize um, their, their campaigns. Um, and so I think that really the takeaway point from, from um, the political realm is that strategies and um, efforts to actively, you know, active efforts to try to change, um, really to change how women think about the political sphere, how, how people think about women as political leaders, are absolutely essential for um, trying to really regender access to, to political office. Oh, thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be here on this really important question. I um, want to just give you some context for my remarks. Um, I, uh, the work that I do um, is really focused on figuring out frameworks, strategies, and mechanisms for advancing institutional change. I've been focused on this question largely in the context of higher education and employment. Uh, and really thinking about the question of both how you frame the problem and also how to um, learn from initiatives that are actually trying to move towards systems change, not only within a particular organization, but across different organizations. Uh, and this is an approach that looks at, I would call, positive deviance uh, as a starting point, uh, looks at places where you're beginning to see mobilization that moves beyond the individual leader or the individual level and begins to have systems level effect. Um, so I, I give you that as a context. I'm, I have not looked at this question specifically in the context of corporate boards. Uh, and I was really moved by the plenary speaker to say, I've also not looked at this issue cross-contextually. I've been really thinking about this question largely in the US, and when I heard the discussion about India, I was struck by how different a world it is, how different the views of groups are in India, how uh, the, the notion that you could identify a group as a plausible uh, unit of analysis for policy, uh, that is an unthinkable move in the US where there's such a strong colorblindness ethos and such a strong commitment to questions of individual merit. Um, so all of that is a kind of backdrop for what I'm going to say. Uh, I invite you to, in the question and answer, to push back on uh, the frameworks that I've developed in this other context to see how they actually apply uh, in the context that we're talking about here. So this conference is really asking the question, how do you go about addressing the lack of participation at, for women at the top of corporations? Uh, is it a time, the conference poses, is this a time for a bolder policy at the top uh, to address not only the issue of diversity at the top, but also the issue of diversity and inclusion in corporations more generally? Uh, and uh, I guess what I'm really posing is the question, what does it mean to have a bolder policy at the top, particularly in the context of the United States. Um, so if you're interested in advancing the participation of women uh, and people of color on corporate boards and in corporations generally, how do you frame the problem and the goal in a way that will advance that goal? Uh, and I want to suggest that there's a need to connect this question to an institutional change and policy change theory. How do you diagnose the problem in a way that will address the problem? How do you have a plausible theory of change that will be sustainable over a period of time? And what is the kind of vision that you need to articulate to be able to motivate that set of questions? Um, and I guess the, maybe the more the controversial thesis I want to suggest is that may, it, it could be that in a culture of individualism and colorblindness, we need to, of course, insist on addressing quite explicitly issues of gender and race, but that the question of advancing women's participation at the top needs to be uh, re-articulated in a way that places that goal in the context of an affirmative mission that's central to corporate sense of their own mission. Um, and so um, I want to 
uh, explore that question. Uh, so first, uh, thinking about this causally, that how do you frame the question in a way, the question of, of gender and, and racial participation in a way that will get at the underlying processes that are causing underparticipation. So I, I, I want to first suggest that if you talk only about uh, gender uh, or race at the level of policy, who's, who's uh, put on the board or not, you're missing these kind of multi-level dynamics that are actually producing the dynamics of underparticipation and that need to be addressed if you're going to even produce the dynamics that get you beyond the one or two tokens who are on the corporate boards now. So just looking at this as a one example of the multi-level dynamics that produce underparticipation at many different levels of the corporation uh, and that also um, help explain why it is that it's so hard to get beyond the one or the two token uh, representatives on a corporate board. Um, so uh, just thinking, I think we, we've heard a lot about the dynamics uh, in some of the other talks that produce these kinds of, um, the, the, the flat, explain the flat line uh, of uh, women's participation uh, in, org, in corporations. Uh, I think just looking at the ecosystem level, um, the notion that we could take uh, the the policy in India uh, or, or even in Norway and superimpose it here without understanding the kind of political dynamics of a quota system in the U.S. Uh, seems, you know, again, Im implausible. So what are the dynamics that are happening at the ecosystem? What are the dynamics that are happening within an institution that uh, we need to think about all of these levels uh, as part of a coherent strategy if we're going to have a sustainable policy that's going to make a difference over time to change those kinds of flat lines. So opening up a spigot to admit a few more women or people of color entering into this dynamic uh, is not going to create the context in which uh, women will have the kind of impact that it sounded like from our plenary speaker they're able to have on, um, on uh, the, the politics on the set of questions uh, that we care about. So what would it mean then to think about the dynamics of, say, boards in ways that take account of these broader concerns. Well, what if you thought about gender as the kind of miner's canary? What are the dynamics that are affecting women at each of these levels that are also affecting participation and values that we care about at a broader, um, at a broader level? How do networks operate uh, in ways that both make it difficult for women to get on the board, but also make it difficult for uh, corporations to be innovative in the way that we were hearing David uh, talk about? Um, what are the uh, ways in which a kind of emphasis on re, uh, kind of reproducing the um, qualities of people who are currently on boards exclude women but also connect to these broader policies around um, advancing innovation? What other aspects of, of firm decision making work might be implicated by the dynamics that produce the low representation of women on boards? Um, so we talked about the need to situate the uh, gender question in a broader multi-level analysis. Uh, the second uh, point that I want to make is that understanding the dynamics that produce uh, under-participation doesn't necessarily answer the question, what do you need to do to change those dynamics? So just, if you, just because you understand why the problem exists doesn't mean you figured out how to solve the problem. So to say it differently, uh, the remedy does not proceed logically from the uh, violation or from the, the problem. So how do you figure out, how do you define the problem in a way that's going to uh, ask, what do I do now? What's the right unit of analysis uh, to proceed uh, so that you're actually going to have an arena in which change can take place? So you need a theory of change. Um, and the uh, third related point is that uh, the kind of change that we're talking about uh, requires uh, pulling together a group of stakeholders uh, that may or may not always see their, their, define their interests in terms of gender. So how do you bring together the range of stakeholders uh, that are going to change the dynamics in a corporation and in terms of board selection uh, such that you would actually uh, produce a difference in the decision making 
decision-making process, how are you going to frame the issue you know, such that you mobilize that group of stakeholders? Uh, and finally, uh, and I think very importantly, defining the goal in terms of a problem in some ways lets us off the hook for, a, uh, for identifying an affirmative vision of the kind of institution that you're trying to create. So one of the things we heard in the plenary speaker's talk was that there are a set of implicit values around the kinds of decisions that we are interested in having made that will advance quality of life, around increasing political participation, a set of other affirmative values uh, that um, participation of women uh, arguably are advancing. How do you connect the issue of gender participation with an affirmative vision of the kinds of institutions and policies that we're trying to create? So I want to then suggest the need for um, a, uh, an affirmative vision that continues to keep the question of bias and the need to remedy bias on the table, but situates that, uh, that critical vision uh, within an affirmative vision of the kind of corporation, we could talk about it in terms of innovation, we could talk about it in terms of democracy, uh, the kind of corporation, we, we could talk about it in terms of ethics, but the kind of corporation that we're trying to create. And the notion is that doing that is both, uh, it, it is important for articulating a theory of institutional change that is likely to, to take. Um, so I'm just going to now really quickly talk about what, what am I talking about with the theory of institutional change. This is a theory that I'm going to run through really quickly quickly, really just to illustrate what I have in mind. It's been developed again in this other context, so uh, you can tell me whether it has applicability um, here. So one, I, I call this the building an architecture of inclusion. It's taking a kind of multi-level approach. We need to think about both the mindset, what is it that we're trying to produce, you need a sense of the mechanisms, and what is actually going to mobilize this change. Um, when we're talking about mindset, um, this notion of having an affirmative vision that is rooted in the culture of the community itself. Uh, mindfulness, I'll talk about it in a moment, and then a change theory to actually move toward that. We're talking about mindfulness. This is a way in which data really comes into play. We heard this in the talk about using implicit bias as a way of actually measuring change. But how do we understand the patterns that are operating within a setting uh, that actually are accounting for persistent underparticipation, even though, in theory, we have corporations that have made commitments to gender equality or to, to uh, racial equality? Uh, and asking these questions at real pivot points. We've heard one in the previous talk when someone has, gives birth to a daughter. Uh, but what are the kind of institutional pivot points that would actually allow you to move toward a, um, change within a, a larger environment? And then what's your change theory? Where are the levers of change? Where can you act programmatically and think systematically? Uh, where are the ways in which you can build on and mobilize positive deviance so that you can begin to get mobility across different institutional settings? You also need to think about mechanisms that are going to enable systemic change, and I think we've heard some of them in the previous talks, but uh, this idea of cultivating capabilities to engage in institutional mindfulness. How do you enable cohorts of people, including cohorts of women, uh, to redefine the standards of merit or to uh, change the systems of decision making such that um, you would be able to move more pe women, people of color, onto corporate boards? And importantly, how do you leverage social and professional networks, which are the ways in which people actually get into these positions. Uh, so how do you essentially create the possibility then for mobilization on multiple levels? And I think this is the kind of thinking that needs to at least accompany uh, a set of more outcome-driven policies if those policies are going to be more than purely symbolic. Corporations are very good at managing, particularly around boards, there's a lot of research to suggest this, managing essentially symbolic legitimacy without actually making change inside the company itself. So really asking the question, what's going to connect a move at the top to a, a, a more systemically rooted set of changes? And this is a, you know, a, an example of the kinds of thinking uh, that um, talking about crucially how do you identify and enable these what I call organizational catalysts Who's going to drive this change process, the people who are in a position to actually mobilize across a bunch of different settings inside and across corporations to put these kinds of issues squarely on the agenda, to influence decision makers so that when someone's making a decision about who to bring onto the board, there will be a, a different conversation having going on. And these are people who have legitimacy within the communities that actually matter. 
Um, these are the kinds of strategies that organizational catalysts use, obviously not something that gets legislated but or that gets a bill, can be accomplished only through policy, but you can think as the National Science Foundation has done in the context of diversifying science, uh, you can think about the creating these kinds of um, public incentives uh, to generate leadership that will then actually have the possibility of transforming uh, activity at many different levels of the corporation. So this is actually going back to that multi-level theory of, of analysis of the problem that isn't only focused on a single level and that is really thinking about policies that will locate activators of change, mobilizers of change in places, in, in key strategic locations where they can have an impact on the many different levels that need to change if you're actually going to address this, this kind of problem. Uh, so uh, that is basically, uh, I guess, the, the, the summary uh, is that I think if we only focused on the question of how are we going to get uh, the, the, in the U.S., uh, how are we going to get corporations to embrace this kind of goal of increasing participation? If we only focus on the outcome, especially now, uh, when affirmative action has been um, so contested, uh, and when you have work like Frank Dobbins, which is saying that uh, that the strategies like this that have been very successful in the 70s and early 80s when you had strong and aggressive uh, administrative uh, enforcement um, have had much lesser impact in the 80s and 90s, uh, and that there's really a need to connect the compliance-oriented strategies of affirmative action with these kind of proactive problem-solving strategies that are really about mobilizing change on many different uh, levels, and that that has to be built into the design of our policy and institutional transformation strategies, that requires articulating self-consciously a theory of change. Uh, and a quota in the US uh, is only a starting point, uh, and I would say a problematic starting point for that larger theory of change. Not problematic because I wouldn't love to have 30% or 50%, but because uh, I think that is just not a viable um, end point, you know, starting uh, point for uh, the, the really serious work that needs to be done to move toward that goal. Thank you. Uh, before I open it up for questions, I wanted to share with you an interesting quote that I came across the other day in looking through some research on this topic, and I think this quote is a very good way of pulling together what we've heard from our four presenters today. Uh, this was something that Sam Walton said at Walmart's 1987 annual shareholders meeting. Uh, he said, Walmart has a strong-willed young lady on the board now who has already told the board it should do more to ensure the advancement of women. Anybody want to guess as to who that strong-willed young lady was? Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. Uh, and I think this is kind of a very interesting quote back in 1987 in terms of seeing the connection between representation of women uh, on boards uh, and the more fundamental question of understanding uh, why this makes a difference in terms of, of, of performance of, of organizations, how it makes a difference in terms of uh, social welfare, uh, and as some of our speakers have identified, the importance of looking at this very holistically uh, and also looking at the representation of women uh, on, in line man top line management positions. We're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, when you um, ask your question, please indicate to which of our speakers you are addressing the question. Hi, my name's Adam Quinton. I had an observation for David and then a question for Amy. The observation I'll preface by saying I have three daughters, um, one of whom's at Barnard, I'm very pleased to say. I also have a son as well, so we're in a sort of 33% minority representation in the household. Um, but more seriously, the observation uh, relates to a firm that I used to work for, and you know, one of my colleagues, who Anne actually knows quite well, was very interested in this question of what she called her male allies, because she was working in the diversity field, and she had a number of people, male and female, who are helping her with her various initiatives, and she was particularly interested in the male um, uh, counterparts she had, or male allies, again, as she described it. 
And she did a little anecdotal survey, so a little bit smaller than the population of uh, Denmark, but she did an anecdotal survey of the people that she was working with, the guys that she was working with. And she went into it thinking that perhaps one of the common factors between her quote-unquote male allies was that they had daughters, or perhaps that it was something to do with their parents. And at least based on her small sample, she concluded that there was one common factor across the whole male uh, partnership group, and it was not that they had daughters. She said the only thing that she could identify, which was clearly common, was that they all had, as best you could define it, an innate sense of fairness. So, you know, yes, there were issues to do with children, but there was a common thought process amongst the male allies, which, again, um, a small sample, but I thought that was worth mentioning. Um, my question for Amy relates to the, the issue of Norway, and particularly whether there's been any work that you've done or others have done about what happens when you have this high percentage of women on boards as it relates to CEO selection. You know, my observation being, having worked for three public companies, that most of the time what the board does for most employees is really invisible, if not actually irrelevant, with one key exception, which is on average every four years or so, the board selects a new CEO, and it's the CEO that drives the culture within the firm much more than the board. Again, that's just my own experience. So I wonder if in the Norwegian context there's any evidence that as board representation has changed, it has had any influence on the gender of uh, CEOs? Yeah, I can speak to that. Is this one? Yeah. Um, no is the answer. I mean, the answer, what I mean by that, by no, is that there hasn't been a change in the percentage of, of, of female CEOs. Now, it might be that this takes time because you may not just immediately, you know, fire your CEO and bring in a woman, but as opportunities for CEO turnover come about, um, that may still happen, but at least at this juncture, there has not been a significant increase or a statistically significant increase. Hi, I'm Fran Smythe from Arts and Business Council. Um, indulge me, I want to tell you a quick anecdote and then I have a question for the entire panel. A number of years ago, there was a major philharmonic orchestra, which I won't name, and all of the musicians were white males. And the orchestra leadership said they couldn't find anyone else of the quality they needed. The orchestra then initiated a change in their selection procedure. They put an opaque partition between the applicant and the people making the selection. And guess what? They ended up with women and people of color in significant numbers very quickly. If one could define and devise a selection process for boards that let the board question the applicant, but without knowing either gender or ethnic background or age, do you think there'd be a significant change in the composition of boards? Um, it's a tough question. I mean, in some senses, it's a tough question because of the way boards are, ch are, are chosen. It, it's so different than an audition. Um, it's um, typically a social network, and so you'd have to kind of break down that social network to have more of, a, of an, interview, an interview process. Um, I'm not directly answering your question, because I guess I don't, I don't know if there would be a difference, but certainly you, could, you would certainly change the pool of applicants, I think, pretty quickly if you, if you changed it from more of a uh, social networking into more of an audition, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, I, I could uh, add to that as well. I mean, in the Norwegian case, I, I was recently um, reading because I'm, you know, interested in, in, in both the quota and non-quota sides. Um, so, in response to the argument that well, we'll never find enough women to to fill this quota, there were a number of groups who initiated. Um, uh, well, they created databases of of qualified women, you know, with with the requisite, you know, educational background and professional experience. Um, and, and there was some variation in terms of how well those worked um, because even though they were, you know, there was this huge pool of very qualified women, people still said that, well, we prefer to, um, you know, people that we know, right? And people that they know are usually, you know, the guys who, who already tapped into those social networks. Um, but I think, you know, it raises some interesting questions because then we also think about, well, when have women benefited from those networks? And those are often the... Um, you know, the w daughters and the wives, right? So it's kind of this thing about like, well, who has the access to the networks? And um, I uh, had a really interesting conversation with a Ugandan um, parliamentarian and she's like, you know, 
Um, you know, in, in the early days of the reserve seats, I mean, the men were, you know, putting forward their wives and their daughters. But um, she said, we have to start somewhere, right? So for her, she thought, well, there are some ways in which certain elite women do, um, you know, do, do have tap, you know, the access to these networks. Um, but over time, hopefully, there, you know, there's this conscious raising on the parts of women and, and elites to, um, to, to come forward. But I, I think with, with um, you know, politics in particular, I mean, it's, it's very difficult, right? Because one of the things we think about as skilled politician is that they're able to um, be an effective public speaker, right? We want to know what their image is. Um, we want to put them on a poster. And in that way, you know, um, it's really difficult for women to escape their you know, that, that gendered aspect of it. So I, I think that's a really fast, fantastic example of when you actually don't see the person and you just look at the quality of their work, you know, women do rise, do rise a, a, ahead. So um, I think that's really important. Yeah. If I could just add very quickly, I mean, there, there is some evidence of that in corporate, the corporate world. I mean, jobs that have like more technically defined characteristics like CFO or senior counsel, you know, you might think the women wouldn't do well in CFO because stereotypically finance is not their field, but actually, relatively speaking, women do better in those jobs than in, say, more strategic-oriented positions. And one theory might be that it's easier to define mm -hmm. what the objective criteria is, and so you can implement something that's at least moving in the direction of what is now become standard practice for major philharmonics around the world. Well, one quick one thing I wanted to add, because I think it t t actually plays on something that, um, that we just heard in the last talk about the strategically placed change agent. One thing you didn't see in Norway was really not only the women as CEOs, but also not as the chairman of the board, or maybe more importantly, on the nominating committee. So another alternative to kind of break up that social networking is to have women strategically placed in a, in a place that would potentially make more of a difference. And if I could just, I think your question is really helpful, but much more as a heuristic than as let's, you know, how, how do we think about this problem rather than how do we actually do what was done in orchestras? So if you think about the orchestra example, um, people can get into the room, women can get into the room because there are ways to get access that are not being closed down by closed networks. If you've gone to, if you basically have, you know, can play music, you can audition, right? Uh, and, um, and secondly, once you're in the room, then the decision-making process is, um, you know, you've been minimized the expression of bias in the decision-making process by putting up the veil. Now, we can't do that in the corporate context, but if you can ask the question, how do you enable um, people um, of, from very diverse backgrounds who are currently not able to get into the room to be considered, how do we do that? And that requires you to think about who has access. Are the ways in which we're currently thinking about access getting the best people into the, onto boards? Are we picking the boards that we really want to have? And how, are the networks that are currently uh, being used actually getting the talent into the boardroom that corporations really need? So that's the kind of how do you actually get into the audition question. And then if you also then say, well, how are we considering people? Well, I think in some ways the mindfulness point is uh, the substitute for the screen. Since we can't eliminate knowledge about who the person is in the context of selecting people on boards, how do we use social psychology um, and uh, priming to say, well, how do we eliminate the expression of bias uh, in the decision-making process when we do know who that, what the identity is? Uh, and I think there is the possibility of doing that uh, in systematic ways in the context of, of these kinds of decisions, but it's not possible to do that by blinding to identity, it's by it really being much more mindful and accountable about decisions that are being made um, such that decisions will be made based on what, we, what we're really looking for uh, around the table and so that differences in the way uh, women and men are evaluated when they give the same speech uh, get removed from the decision-making process. Hello, my name is Suzanne Matthews. I went to the business school and I also spent uh, 27 years in financial institutions. And I have a question for David, which is that based on my experience, uh, those men who tend to promote and mentor uh, women are those uh, men who also have wives who are professional women or who have leadership roles in corporations or other companies. And I just wanted to know, um, have, has there been any studies done on that aspect? Okay, so the, uh, the short answer is I'm not, I'm not aware of that study, but I think that both you and the, uh, the previous gentleman who commented are, are highlighting something very important. So, you know, 
what, you know, I, I ultimately, and I actually had this conversation with someone from Catalyst, you may be familiar with this organization, but th this woman had done some similar kinds of research to the one I described within a U.S. context. And what we, our sort of informal opinion that we came to is that ultimately it really is a sense of fairness, right? I mean, if you, that, if you could go in and you could, not just by asking people, but perform some more sophisticated test of the kind that Esther Duflo mentioned earlier to monitor people's fairness with regard to gender, that of course would be the ultimate driver of, of all, you know, all these things that we've been talking about. Then the question though then becomes, you know, what actually drives a man's fairness attitude or how much he cares about that toward, with regard to gender, and that's where things like having professional wives could indeed be an issue. Um, people have used that, um, in, I guess, as an instrument in certain kinds of studies, but haven't linked it to some of the outcomes that we talked about earlier today. I'm Anke Erhard. I'm uh, from psychiatry at uh, Columbia here. I, I just wanted to make a comment. Of, I have been on the board of the Ford Foundation for the last 12 years. And they have, during the whole time, there have been 40 to 50 percent women on the board. And uh, with an explicit uh, commitment uh, to that, it's a small board, 15, uh, 15 members uh, typically, from corporations and from the universities, etc. And there is a kind of, in my experience, a tipping point. If you have 40 percent of women in an organization like that, then we all had networks of women. It was not hard to find other women and to replace and replenish the women. I think there is that, that's the advantage of quotas, to get into it, to have this kind of tipping point. If you start to be in other organizations where you're the only woman or with uh, two women, then it's hard and nobody you know, can come up with them. There are not enough women. So this, this tipping point of having enough women there who then have their own networks, I think is a very important one. I think all of that, the wives and the husbands and the children are important, but uh, the numbers are important. And so that's why the equivalent, even Susan, if you say we can't have quotas in the US, something like guidelines or recommendations to get up there would make a huge difference. Okay, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll start the next panel.